Are you ready for a little bit of spontaneity in your life? Do you like to do things without having to think about them very much? If that is the case, then spontaneous watercolor landscapes might just be for you. Hi, I'm Barry Techmeyer, and I'm a watercolor artist here in Kansas City. And I'm here in my studio getting ready to teach the class about how to paint with a little bit of spontaneity. I'll have to say, probably about four years ago, I became interested in an artist by the name of Steve Mitchell. And Steve Mitchell was able to teach me different things, different techniques, different ways of being more spontaneous in my artwork. How to create worlds that are in my head, but not necessarily on the painting in the paper. So I want you to stick around and I want you to get your paintbrush ready because we are ready to jump into the world of spontaneous watercolor landscapes. In this class, we're going to explore methods and materials that will allow you to create impromptu paintings. You're going to learn to practice various techniques when you don't really know what to paint. And you're going to apply the use of an underpainting and putting down paint to see just what happens, what emerges. Watercolor has a mind of its own. The artist is just along for the journey. And that's basically what this class is all about. From this point, I'm going to go over an explanation of supplies. What supplies do you need to paint a spontaneous watercolor landscape? Also, we're going to be talking about what a limited palette is, how you can limit the colors you're using, composition, the three sections of a spontaneous landscape, and using an incredible supply called a dip pen, and talking about the types of trees you might see in the mountains or in the forest. Then we're going to practice four different paintings and end with a final painting where we're going to be using masking fluid first and then the paint on top. So let's talk about some of the supplies we're going to be using. Most of the supplies are ones that you would use in a normal watercolor painting. However, there are several that I think you will find interesting and that you will enjoy using. First of all, we have watercolor paper. Now, I enjoy Arches watercolor paper simply because it's always 100% cotton, which is important. And also this is a 300 pound paper, uh, which is nice and thick, and that way I do not have to tape it down to a watercolor board. I can just use it flat on the table. Now it also comes in a 140 pound, but for the activities we're going to be doing today, probably a 300 pound will be best. Now let's talk brushes. These are round brushes. And they're called round because, as you can see, the brush part is round. This is a silver black velvet synthetic brush. And with a silver black velvet, they're wonderful because their tips keep really, really sharp. And you can make nice little details with them. The next two are what we call mop brushes. Mop brushes are just really good for nice, thick, juicy washes. Same thing. This is an incredible brush. It is a squirrel hair brush holds a lot of water, it holds a lot of paint, and it's once again fantastic for when you're doing those washes that take up a lot of space on your painting. And this is a smaller mop brush from the company Dugato. It's wire wrapped as you can see, and this comes in several different sizes. And this is a larger flat brush. This one happens to be made out of sable. It's probably one of my nicer brushes. And I think it's about a number 10. And finally, we have a rigger. And this rigger is going to come in really handy. This is another silver black velvet rigger. You notice it has a 1. There's, usually a, there's also a 0, some other smaller sizes. This is fantastic for details. And especially for those tops of trees and, and little grasses on the ground. Great for details. For paint, we're going to be talking about how I chose these paints earlier. These are tube watercolor paints. I prefer Winsor Newton. 
And here we have my palette, which is basically a butcher tray. It's ceramic. I've got warm colors on the bottom, cool colors on the top. And once again, we'll talk more about the colors and painting later. You're going to need two containers of water. One for dirty water, one for clean water. Now, something that you may not have used before is this container of masking fluid. We, you will need this for our last painting of the day, and I think that you'll enjoy the, the process. And this is what we call a dip pen. A dip pen has a pen on the end. This is what uh, calligraphers use to write names with and different things. And there's several inexpensive ones. This one's more expensive. I like the plastic handle on it. I also like the lid. And finally, this is a mister. It's not a spray bottle. It is a mister. It's got a nice fine mist. Instead of blobs of, of water, you're going to have not that nice mist. And I have heard that the dollar store has these fairly inexpensive. Now, spontaneous, impulsive, instinctive, automatic. Spontaneous implies a lack of prompting and connotes naturalness, not planned. And that's going to be the key. We're going to be using resources, but the main thing is we're going to be looking at what the paint has to offer. Earlier I had mentioned that we were going to start talking about the colors that you would choose to use. And a limited palette means that you only use about three or four colors. And that way you're focusing more on the content of what your painting is going to be and less on the colors. However, you want those colors to be effective. The activity I'm doing right here is called a triad. I'm taking red, yellow, and blue, the primary colors, and I'm using a clean a water-filled brush, rinsing it out between each one and wiping it down, and seeing what happens when I mix those colors together. And I'm going to do this a couple times. Now with these colors, I noticed that um, that orange is a nice orange that I could use. But when I mix the yellow and the blue together, it gets kind of muddy, and I'm not sure if I like that or not. And let's try the blue and the red. Each time I'm rinsing it out and drying it down, once again, trying it muddy. You have to check your watercolors first before you start using them in the paint because this might happen. All right, so let's try three different colors here, three different primary colors. So I have my yellow. And next will be the red. Rinsing out my brush, drying it off, and getting some blue, a different blue this time. And let's try mixing these together and see what happens. My yellow and red together. Not as nice as the other yellow and red, not as nice orange, but it's still there. Again, a little bit muddy. And I'm getting about the same thing. The, the violet is a little bit more violet. Um, it's still just too brown for me. Okay, so let's do the yellow and the blue together. And the blue is awfully cool, and that yellow is a cool uh, yellow as well. Um, so, here are the colors. I know that I want cadmium red and Windsor yellow together to make the orange. The others probably aren't going to work as well. So since I need a violet and a green, I want to go ahead and try the violet I have and see what it's going to look like when I do a graduated wash with it. So what I'm doing is I'm rinsing off my brush, drying it off, getting some clean water, and then bringing it out to see what happens. And here's the green. I'm going to do the same thing. Let's make a graduated wash and see how it's going to look. Clean water, paper towel, dry it off. I'm dragging it out until it's lighter, lighter, and lighter. And so I think I have my three colors. 
I'm going to be using the Windsor Violet, which is the top violet. And I'm going to use Sap Green, for the green. And for the orange, I'm going to be mixing together Cadmium Red and Windsor Yellow, which is this color right here. And I find this a very crucial step before doing any painting, is to check to see what it's going to look like when they mix together. Another important step to take before you start painting is to talk about composition and think about where you're going to place things on the page. When doing a spontaneous landscape, there are three sections that you have to think about. So let's take a look at this photograph and think, where are the three sections within this photograph? Where are there definite lines that I'm going to need to consider? The first line is the sky. You'll have the blue of the sky and then a tree line. We will focus a lot on drawing trees, so we need to know where we're going to put them. And finally, you need to know where the horizon line is so that you can get the composition put together. Let's look at this photograph. Where are the sections within this landscape? Where is the sky? Where are the trees? And where is the horizon? Take a second and see if you can figure that out. And here we are. Up at the top we have the blue of the sky, we have the tree line, and then we have the horizon. Notice they're on a diagonal. A diagonal is a nice composition tool. Now, within the paintings, as you're putting on the paint to the paper, I like to think about several compositional types. Those are the X, the Y, the greater than, and the T. So let's take a look at this photograph once again. Which one of those do you think it is? Where do you see lines coming across and which one of those composition styles would it be? And here we have a Y. You'll notice the axis is right there be where the two lines meet. Now let's look at this one. We have in the foreground a very large tree and a group of trees going down smaller. So which composition style do you think this might be? And this is a greater than. You see how the two lines come together and as the trees go back they get smaller which creates that form of the greater than. And here's a nice canyon photo. Look very carefully. What do you think the composition style is here? And it is the X. You have the line at the top of the canyon coming all the way down on both sides with a focal point in the middle. And then there's this one. Once again, look carefully. Look specifically at the horizon. What composition style do you think this is? And it is a T. The horizon coming across the top, and then starting with a tree and coming down, and when you have the axis, it creates a T. Now I want to talk about where do you get all your resources? Well, I just Google free cliff and tree photos, or free forest photos. Free is important because you want to use photographs that the artist probably would not mind you using. So you need to double check and make sure that they are free. And you can do that just by, by Googling the free and then clicking on it and making sure it works. Lots of trees. Look, remembering those different compositional styles and thinking which one of the photographs would, be, would work for a resource. Resource being I'm not going to copy it exactly, but I'm going to look for a tree in a photograph that I really like that I could place in my painting. Or... I can look at specifically the style of the composition. Is it an X, a Y, a greater than? We're 
going to be looking at four different trees that you can draw. You cannot be limited to these trees, but these are trees that you would see in the mountains areas or maybe possibly in the woods. So it'll be four that would be good for you to practice drawing. Now we're going to be using our dip pen and I'm starting out with a violet paint, getting it nice and juicy, lots of water. When you use a dip pen, you want to scrape the brush over the back of the dip pen of what's called the nib. And then you want to turn it over and shake it. Now you can tell the pen is full when the little hole is full of paint. And when you draw with a, with a dip pen, you're just basically using line. Now this first tree is an aspen. And an aspen is a more traditional tree in that this one is going to have leaves on it. And if you've ever been to Colorado, you know you've seen lots and lots of aspens. And they grow in several different ways. This one was wider, the one I'm looking at. I am looking at a resource photo as I'm working and just noticing the little lines, specifically where the branches are. Now to use a dip pen, the important thing is that the pressure that you put on the dip pen is how much paint is going to come to the surface and how much you can have for your lines. You have to be careful though, sometimes if you press too hard, the dip pen will release too much paint and you'll have to come in with a paper towel or something to kind of clean that up. And, and I do that later on and you see any of the other ones and you'll see how I handle that. Um, but these are just practices. It is important to practice the trees and get familiar with them, get familiar with the shape, um, so that when you do spontaneous painting, when you see a cliff or something, you say, oh, I think that some aspen would look good on that. You can get some photographs of aspen and continue to put those into your painting. When you draw leaves, you don't want to think about individual leaves. You want to think about groups, specifically little clumps of clusters of leaves that would be together. And this one just kind of creating a jiggy jaggy line and placing them around on the tree, looking at the photograph and seeing where those clusters of leaves would be. And don't worry about if they're not exactly the same. Making sure that you're seeing some sky through those leaves and also making sure that some of the branches are seen because you don't want this to appear two-dimensional. You want to feel more three-dimensional. Make sure that you clean out your dip pen between each use otherwise you're going to end up with one color and the other color um, I cleaned off with a paper towel first really well it's kind of wiping the paint off I also dip it in the water rinse it around a little bit and that helps too but you may want to check it first your first couple times so you know how you're doing it now same thing taking my brush filling it with paint and then putting it into the reservoir of the dip pen shaking it a little bit to make sure that the paint doesn't fall out. Now for the Douglas fir, to create the leaves on it, actually they're needles, um, I'm using little tiny lines as I'm going. And you'll find that on a lot of the fir trees. This one is very hardy, has a nice thick base. So if you're looking at a painting and you're thinking, oh, well this would be a good place to have a nice big thick tree then the Douglas fir might be the one that you want and you would look over your resource photos to see if you find one that might work that you like the shape of it now not only will you paint the needles in this situation but you're also looking for those little branches that are coming out and just making a nice little detail so don't neglect to put those into your drawing as you're working also look at the direction of the groups of those needles together. The wind really plays a part in how this tree is formed, specifically because all these trees are ones you would find in the mountains again or in the woods. And the wind causes those branches to bend 
and to make interesting shapes. And I think that's why I like drawing them so much. I generally start towards the top and work my way down. On the last tree, I did start at the bottom, work my way up. But here on the Douglas fir, I thought it was important to start at the top because it was smaller and then I can go down towards the bottom. Now, the dip pin, you can draw lighter if you don't press down quite as much. And you will run out of paint eventually, so you have to look at see how, how it's working as far as is the paint going down onto the paper well. And I like to go ahead and put paint on there before I completely run out. So that way I've got at least some marks on the paper. I'm creating shading now just by taking the dip pen and doing some hatch marks. Hatch marks being little lines. I'm creating lots more lines together where there's a shaded area where it's darker and leaving some space to create the texture of the tree, specifically the bark of the tree. Cannot emphasize enough how important it is to clean off your dip pen between each use. And now we're painting one of my favorite trees to draw, and that is the Krumholz. The Krumholz is again is a tree that has been in the wind, in the weather, and is all messed up, is all bent over, and it just has personality, has a lot of interesting things to draw. I'm going to use uh, red for this one. And don't forget to turn it over and shake your dip pen so that you do not get um, some splashes of paint the very first thing. For the Krumholz, I am starting from the bottom again and working my way up just because with this one, there's so much character um, that the bends and everything are not what you would see in a regular tree. Once again, we're looking at resource photos as we're drawing here. So these are practices so that when we get into our paintings, it'll be much easier for us to figure out, oh yes, a Krumholz would look good in this situation. So taking those lines and really looking at all the twists and turns where the branches are, looking to see how the tree um, bends in certain situations. This does have some pine needles on it, but the pine needles again are all towards that one side. And so look to see how those are clustered. It's not going to be like a normal pine tree would be. If they are going to be in clusters, but they're going to be bent out of shape. Now within these clusters, you're going to have lots and lots of little textures. Don't feel like you have to fill in all of those clusters with the little lines. Instead, just imply that the lines are there. Put some lines here, lines there. Especially look where there's a shadow or where there's a darkened area. Make sure to include those groups of lines to create the pine needles.
great memories with Lodgepole Pine. Every time we would stop in Colorado at a park, there's always these tall, tall pine trees uh, that surrounded where we, were, where we were staying. Once again, cleaning out of that dip pin is going to be important, as well as wiping down your brush and making sure it's clean too, because um, that's, that's going to be important to get all that color out of there so that when you are putting it into the dip pin, it will work. Otherwise, you'll end up with violet instead of with blue. So we're getting a nice juicy bit of uh, paint there, of blue, and then we're wiping it onto um, the dip pen well so it fills up and ready to start drawing. Now for this pine, I like to go ahead and draw the trunk first. Um, and I like to start at the top because those needles and those groupings are going to be much, much smaller and easier for me to maneuver through as opposed to the ones towards the bottom that get bigger. Now in looking at this photograph, there are some interesting things happening um, because the tree towards the bottom has less needles and less groupings than way at the top. And it creates a triangular form as it's coming down. So think of that as you're going. Normally towards the top, these are very, very, very skinny and towards the bottom, they don't get very much wider. So the triangle is a tall, skinny triangle as opposed to a fatter triangle. Now that you got an experience with the dip pen and drawing trees, I want you to take your watercolor paper and divide it up into four spaces. We're going to be creating four different paintings in each, one in each of these spaces. Starting out by taking our mister and misting down the paper and then using two of the colors uh, that we came up with earlier. Starting out with the yellow and now I'm going to be placing the blue in there. Now this would be an X. Notice as I'm painting I'm thinking X. And I'm giving it a little spritz every once in a while. Now you can come back in with some more paint if you want it to be a little bit darker. You can leave it this lighter color. Now if you get any puddles, what you need to do is dry off your brush and just drag it over the puddle so that that doesn't drip. Now be careful because you don't want to get rid of any of the color. Now let's think of a greater than. I start out with a yellow and spritz the paper before and after and now I'm using the red on top of it. You can kind of predict what's going to happen with the paint since you did that triad of colors earlier. And this is a Y. 
This time I'm starting with the violet and adding the blue on top of it. Notice that I'm not trying to paint the whole paper. Also notice that I'm just letting the paint do its job. Remember we said it had a mind of its own. Let it do that. And here's the tea, starting with the yellow, and I think I'll use the blue again. Putting a little bit more paint on there. Now I'm taking my dried brush, putting up rid of some of those puddles. And we're gonna just let this sit for a while and let it dry. I decided I want a little bit more yellow in that one. And when it dries, notice that watercolor always dries lighter. So think about that when you're laying down your colors. We're going to start in this top corner. Looking at it very carefully, I see the tip of a mountain and I see a yellow cloud coming by. Now with these colors, we're not doing realistic colors where we're sticking with that triad. And looking back, I found a photograph that I can look at. And this time I'm going to let you see the photographs. So you get an idea of, hey, I'm not necessarily copying the photograph, but I am looking at it as a resource on how to draw the trees. These are some of those tall pine trees. And it's better when you're starting out, specifically with this one, draw a smaller tree as opposed to a larger tree. I think then you can focus more on composition. But look how the trees overlap. Look how some of them are larger, some of them are smaller. How are they going to fill your space? How are they going to look in this world that you're creating? This very spontaneous world where you just laid some paint down the paper and now we're going to turn that paint into a painting. Now that I have a couple of trees laid down in this painting, I decided to start working on some of the foreground trees, which are smaller, and I'm using my brush to paint those in. I'm using that rigor, that small brush. And with this one, you want to consider the darkness of the paint, um, and you also want to know where do you want the viewer's eyes to look. I'm thinking that that tall tree with the yellow cloud shaft of light that's coming down uh, would be where I want their eyes to look. So I'm dipping my brush in the water and getting a little bit of paint that way and making it lighter so that these trees that I'm painting now, first of all, they're smaller and second of all, they're going to be lighter in value. The rigor brush, you can see, is very nice to do little details. Um, and it's it just a hint of what the shape needs to be. You're not needing to paint a whole bunch of little details But I do like to do some vertical strokes to give the illusion of some trees in that specific area So I'll let you keep watching and see how I attempt to finish this off. Now remember um, That these colors are going to get lighter after they dry
I'm looking at this painting now and I decided that I wanted to include a Krumholtz. I found a photo of a Krumholtz uh, that I really, really liked. And I'm starting to paint the main sections of the branches that are bent over. Um, notice on the yellow, I decided the yellow was going to be kind of more the ground area. And I liked how that little red kind of created uh, not a mist effect behind, or maybe even that could be like a clump of uh, the pine needles that are on it. And you can see I put a little bit of the pine needles there um, on the top. But again, some of the same things we talked about earlier. Uh, you're just working very carefully at looking at the photograph, seeing where the clusters are, seeing how uh, the branches are bent and how they look completely different than the pine trees that we just drew in the other painting. This time the tree is going to be, this tree is going to be much larger uh, just because I think it's going to be easier to get those details in. And oops, you may have seen just what happened. Uh, that's a, a situation where the dip pen decided it wanted to drip on the paper. And once again, you just work with it. Uh, since this is spontaneous, you work with the shape. And I add more uh, specific branches within there and more pine needles just so that that accident never happened. I'm adding in some of the ground with my paintbrush also decided to take my rigger and paint some very thin uh, leaves of grass and have that be on the top of the mountain or whatever. And then we move on to painting number three. For this one, I decided to go ahead and use a photograph that I found that were nice aspens in a valley around the mountains. So for this one, I'm going to try and make it a more complete uh, painting. Now the good thing about these smaller paintings is you can take these and make them into larger paintings later, if that's what you want. I kind of like how they, they are nice vignettes uh, from something we're looking at. Again, we're not copying the photograph exactly. Coming in with my brush, and now I'm doing something called negative painting where I'm painting around that shape. I really liked the shape of that white space down there at the bottom. I'm just taking some of that blue paint and painting around the outside to emphasize the shapes of those quote unquote trees that are back down there. They were not in the photograph. However, they live in this specific painting. Now I'm also taking my brush and darkening the branches and darkening um, the, the trunks of the trees. And now painting in some more smaller trees down here towards the bottom to make that more full, to make it look more like a valley. Adding in a, a diagonal line. I think that works in this specific situation. Using that rigger brush to add more detail, just a little bit of grasses using the rigger brush with a little bit of water on it and some of the violet to paint some more trees that are similar to what the main trees are but they're more towards the back. Starting my fourth and final spontaneous landscape painting here and for this one we're doing another pine tree and looking more at composition this time. This one, as we talked earlier, this was kind of a Y. So I started more the center where that vertical line would come down. But we're just gonna watch me draw and paint. And I want you to notice what techniques I use that I've used previously. And then we'll talk about them towards the end.
use a technique here that I have not used before and that is just simply taking my brush and holding it sideways and dragging it across the paper to dry brush a little bit and you can see how that creates a nice texture specifically for hills or mountains as they're coming down diagonally. Now let's talk about some of the techniques I used. Do you see where I used negative painting? There in the yellow section. I tried to make trees show up by painting around the outside. I also used my dip pen to create the vertical lines for the pine trees. And then I used my rigger brush to create the smaller paintings, the smaller trees here in the front and also there on the right hand side. Finally, taking my rigger brush sideways and dragging it across the paper. Before we start a painting, we are going to back up and follow through all the steps so that you can see how do you do a finished painting. Now I'm doing my triad of colors. I have a yellow green and a red, I believe a burnt umber, and I'm going to see how these look mixed together. Do not skip this process because if you do, then when you start painting you're going to get some colors that you're not really happy with. I like the dull red that that is creating. Make sure I'm rinsing my brush and wiping it off and getting clean paint, clean water each time. Mixing this together kind of a greenish brown color. Now let's see what happens when I do the red, I believe with the burnt umber. And I believe let's have three very strong colors to use in this painting. So I'm using 140 pound arches. I wanted you to see how you tape it down. Now we're taking that masking fluid and a small paintbrush that I only use for masking fluid, putting the masking fluid on the paintbrush and then using it to tap on my finger so it splatters all over the paper. Now we are being once again very spontaneous with this. We're not necessarily thinking, okay, this would look good here and this would look good here. We're not thinking composition yet. We're just thinking about putting this down on the paper. The more you have on there, the whiter your paper is going to be. You're going to have more white spots. Now I'm starting by mixing up those three colors. And when I'm using uh, those three colors, I've got the yellow, I mixed up with the green, and I'm also using my flat brush this time. With my flat brush, I'm just taking it and I'm just letting it dance across the paper. Now at this point in time that masking fluid is dry, but I want my paper to be a little bit wet. So it's wet down with water or I have misted it. And you can see already how that masking fluid um, is showing the white of the paper. Then I'm taking the red and I'm putting some on top of it. Once again, just playing around with the shapes, not, not mixing it as you're going you're dabbing it onto the paper. If you mix it, you're going to end up with a whole bunch of that darker color that you're seeing there. You do want to think trees, so I am thinking kind of going vertically with some of these lines. Bring some of the color down here towards the front. Okay, this is pretty wet. But I want you to notice how I'm still just using the tip of my brush kind of vertically to create that illusion of trees. Now it has dried for quite a while. You can use a hair dryer on it if you want, but it's pretty juicy, so it may take a drying overnight and just waiting for the next day. 
And I cleaned the masking off with my hand and I also used, it's a rubber cement pickup, that seems to work really well. I'm mixing up my brown with a little bit of green. For the brown, I believe I used a burnt umber and an ultramarine uh, with a little bit of green. I'm testing it first. And this is what I'm going to start looking for um, trunks in this painting. So I'm seeing some places where, yes, that might be a top of a tree. Just adding some vertical lines. Now notice that these vertical lines are not solid. Uh, there may be some leaves over each other there. So we don't want to paint a solid line. You can come back and fill it in later if it doesn't work very well. I'm going to use a lot of this brown uh, because it does add a nice illusion of some trunks. Start observing, start looking, start thinking what could be here. Now if there's one thing I want you to do, I do not want you to copy my painting because what I'm creating here is something that's from my mind. I don't want you to copy it because then you're not coming out with what's in your mind and what your painting looks like. Taking the rigger brush down, I just added a little bit of water to it so I can kind of smooth in some of that paint that's right there in the front. Softening the edges to it with just water. I'm not adding more paint here. Darkening some of the areas where I think there might be some shadows. And as I'm looking at this, I'm noticing, oh, this might be a nice path coming down this way. So I think I'll emphasize the edges, because on a path you might have, oh, some brush and some different things there. Now I'm cleaning off my dip pen that we've used a lot. We've got a lot of use out of that dip pen so far. And with this dip pen, we're going to start working on the branches and the tops of the trees. Looking at my painting from a distance, it is striking. I love the colors together. Same technique we've used before. You fill your paintbrush with paint and you rub it off on the side so that that dip pin well is full. Turn it over and shake it so that it does not um, cause any drips. Test it first. See, there's a drip. Test it first and make sure that it's going to flow well. And you don't have to clean it out better. And now on these trees, especially the branches towards the top, you want to make sure that you are leaving spaces where the leaves are covering up the different areas. Now, I am looking at some trees to kind of get some ideas. But for this one, I did a lot of things just out of my imagination, which is perfectly okay. As long as you have an idea what the trees look like. Now, we've practiced a lot with trees, so you know what the forms are. You know how the branches are. And this specific one would be more like the aspens that we would see in the mountains. This is not necessarily in the mountains this time. This is more of a forest. So if you're looking for resource photos, you might want to look at forest photos, the free forest photos, instead of mountains. But again, that's totally up to you as far as what you want the subject to be. Keeping the branches nice and light. Be careful about how much you press down to create those branches. You want them to be thin and delicate. If you want to practice on another piece of paper first, you could do that before jumping into a finished painting. There are no two trees alike. There's lots of overlapping, so look for places where the branches are going to overlap. Keeping those branches simple because you're not going to see a whole bunch of detail. Those are back in the distance. Here in the front, there's some bushes. I'm remembering from my memory what it was like to walk down a path and seeing some smaller bushes to the side. So I'm adding, doing the same thing I did with the branches, only it's like underbrush so it's much smaller
Once I was satisfied with all of the branches and, and getting the details with my dip pen, then I came in and started adding some more color where I felt that the trees need to be more uh, delineated. They need to show where they're at. So and I felt that the red um, would work the best. So I'm looking at this path. I'm seeing back here towards the background that I want to add uh, some more shapes of a few trees. And they're not going to be too large. But the ones here that are closer, I wanted to emphasize some contrast. I want to add some more of the red so they show up a little bit better and so that there's some shadows and it's not all one fuzzy color. Most of the time when you're painting with watercolor, you will have what's known as a base color or your first color that you lay down. And that's going to be the lighter red that you're seeing. And then you're going to have the darker color where there will be shadows. And that's what's happening here. You'll see that those colors that are in the trees that I'm adding that are red, um, it becomes much richer because you're putting two colors together, a lighter color and a darker color. In looking at my painting more closely, I noticed a couple trees um, that I wanted to emphasize more that are kind of in the middle ground. Um, they have green for the top, so I got my dip pen filled with brown. I shook it out again so that I get all the rid of all the drips. And I started to go ahead and add some tall trees right in that area because that green on the top, I think, will be excellent to add a little bit more kind of a, some balance because you have tall trees on the left hand side and to unify it I wanted to add some tall trees on the right hand side definitely not making them look the same once again thinking about what a tree looks like and this is a good example of where I am using very very light branches very very small branches because they are far away and here in the very, very background, there's also some as well. But you have to be careful about the thickness of the paint that you're using. And you need to be careful about how dark you're making it. Otherwise, it'll take away from it. And here I'm starting with the green. And I'm doing the same thing I did with the red. These two trees, there's kind of an umbrella top on them. So I'm doing some negative painting again. And I'm painting kind of around to show the tops of those trees. Just adding a little bit and then a little bit of brushing back and forth to kind of blend in the dark with the light. And you can see how that's making that tree show. This is gonna mostly become the center of interest. It's gonna take your eye back there to that point. It's at this time that I kind of take a step back from the painting and see what's missing. And I realize I just want to touch up the contrast right here in the foreground just a little bit. Not too much, but just enough to uh, delineate that path going back or showing that it's there. And here's the finished painting. I always tell my students to stop before you think you're done. I think it turned out pretty great. To wrap things up here at the end, I have some questions for you. First of all, what is one of the benefits of using a limited palette? Why was that a choice that I made to have you do a limited palette before you started painting? 
Next, what were the three sections of a spontaneous watercolor landscape that we looked at photographs and we said, okay, these are three sections you need to keep in mind when you're doing your planning. Next, what can a dip pen do that a paintbrush can't? Why do we utilize both of them in this kind of painting? And finally, before you start painting on a piece of watercolor paper, before you do anything, what are the steps you need to do to make yourself successful? What are the things that you need to do prior to beginning the painting? So look over those questions, think about them, and hopefully you've learned a lot by watching this video. And my challenge to you is pick up the paintbrush and get started.